All right, up next, we're going to discuss understanding and mastering the CIS or CIS component. Now, the questions that we need to answer in this lecture include, what is the CIS? What makes up the CIS? How is the CIS graded? How do I get my CIS points? What are the ultimate goals of the CIS? How to foster the relationship? How to combine CIS into information gathering skills? How to demonstrate an ability to support emotions? Behaviors you need to master in order to improve your score. And then I'm gonna give you a sample SP checklist to give you an idea of what the SP looks at after they finish dealing with you in the room. So as you can see, the CIS component does make up a lot of important things. And so let's just dive right in. If you guys need, slow down. You can slow down or you can speed up the speed of these lectures. If you want, you can actually slow down the lecture. It'll help you get through things in a more efficient manner because you'll be able to take notes without pausing. So if that's something you wanna do, go ahead and do it. So first, what is the CIS? Well, the CIS stands for Communication and Interpersonal Skills. It really consists of putting many little different skills together and really just making it look easy. Now, the different behaviors need to be implemented that show your abilities to communicate well and make the SP feel comfortable with you throughout the entire encounter. Now, this is what makes up the patient-centered communication skills. Number one, fostering the relationship. Number two, gathering information. Now, this is similar, but different from the ICE. So in ICE, we talked about what you need to gather. Here, we're gonna talk about how you gather it. Very important. Number three is providing information. Number four is helping the patient make decisions about the next steps. And number five is supporting emotions. Now, how is this all graded? By the SP. As I said, after, they, after you exit the room, they have a checklist they're gonna go through. They're gonna check yes or no. Did you do this, this, this? We have no idea how many pieces are actually on their checklist. However, we've been teaching students live for many, many, many years, and we've developed our own list of SP uh, checkpoints based on our own practice encounters. And there's anywhere from 40 to 60 usually per encounter. So that's a lot, but when you know how to approach the encounter, approach the patient, you're gonna find that it's actually pretty easy to get all of your points. Now, how do you get these points? Well. The easiest way to see where your points come from is to dissect the encounter into separate pieces. So what we do is we dissect it into the doorway, the entrance. When you walk through that door, you're immediately being judged by the SP and the judgment that they place on you can set the tone for the entire encounter. So how do you get points at the doorway when you, when you enter? First of all, knock. Then when you see them, make eye contact, smile, say hello, shake their hands. That's the first 10 seconds of the encounter and it's going to set the pace. You do that really, really well, you're gonna see that the encounter might go a little better than you would expect it. Now, if you come in and you mess all that up, yes, you might have to um, win back the patient, but you can still do it. But we're gonna talk about bookending shortly and bookending is where you have a really killer entrance and a really killer exit and it sort of bookends the entire encounter like a set of bookends that keeps books nice and tightly together you wanna bookend your encounter with a killer entrance and a killer exit, and I'm gonna show you how to do that after. Now, once you're inside the room, the interview, you have to, so you've, you've made eye contact, you said hello, you smiled, you shook hands. You're gonna ask permission to sit down. So you're gonna say, Mr. Jones, is there anything I can do to make the room more comfortable? They say, no. Is it okay if I take a seat and ask you some questions? They say, sure. You take a seat, and then you start with an open-ended question, and we'll talk about how to do all these things later. The physical exam, a couple things that'll get you points. Ask if it's okay to begin. Wash your hands. Let me just side note here and say to you, if you forget to wash your hands, assume you fail the encounter because nobody wants you to put your hands on their face if they haven't seen you wash them. You have to make sure you do it and that's why we're gonna build washing hands into the routine of doing your physical exams. Now, as you go through the physical exam, explain what you're going to be doing why you're gonna be doing it. Then if the patient needs to lay down, sit up, stand up, help them up and down as needed. And then the closure, explain the findings. And I'm gonna give you a script that you can actually memorize that'll ensure you get all the points you need when you're doing your closure. You're going to explain findings. You're gonna ensure that they understand everything. You're gonna to offer to answer, to answer questions that they might have. You're going to explain the workup exams you're going to do. Then you're gonna say goodbye the right way. You're gonna bookend that ending. So 
sys points broken down into entrance, interview, physical exam, and closure. Now, if you miss anything that I just outlined here that's on this slide, assume you will lose points. All right, so I'm gonna repeat it one more time. At the doorway, when you enter, smile, say hello, make eye contact, shake hands. During the interview, ask to sit, start with an open-ended question. During the physical exam, ask if you can begin, wash your hands, explain what you're doing, help the patient up and down. Closure, explain the findings, ensure they understand them, offer to answer any questions, explain the workup you're, gonna, you're going to do, and then say goodbye the right way. If you can do just that, you'll get 90% of your CIS points. Now the ultimate CIS goals, and these are things that I believe and my team of physicians believe are the core of getting your maximum CIS points. Number one, make the patient feel comfortable. We've all been to physicians, to doctors um, in the past, and maybe we didn't feel 100% comfortable with them. And there could be a variety of reasons why. When you aren't comfortable with someone, the encounter or the situation isn't as enjoyable as it could be. Now, let me ask you, if you don't enjoy, let's say, spending 15 minutes with someone, but you have to grade them on how great they were during those 15 minutes, how good do you think you're going to give them of a grade versus if you sat with them for 15 minutes and they made you feel comfortable, you laughed, you talked a little bit, you're going to give them more points. So this is a personal exam. This isn't step one or CK where you pick a multiple choice and you're either right or wrong. You have to build these personal connections. And one of the most important things to getting you points is making the patient feel comfortable. Now, how do you make them feel comfortable? Make a connection with them. If you can make a connection with someone, they're going to automatically like you more. You want to make the encounter feel like a team effort. What that means is that you're not just there to dictate the entire encounter. You're there to work as a team. So you offer, these are the things I'd like to do. Can we begin? These are some questions I'd like to ask you. Is it okay if I ask you? You don't just say, okay, tell me what brings you in. Okay, when did that start? How does that feel? No, no, no. I'm gonna ask you a few questions about your specific problem. Is that okay if I get started? When you do that, you're actually asking permission, but they're letting their guard down when you do that because you're making them feel like you're not just there to boss them around, but you're there to help them. You also want to let them talk and share. You wanna show them that you truly care. And the best way that I can tell you to show people you really care is when you walk into that room, Pretend it's your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma, your grandpa. Pretend they are family and don't stray from that. And if you do that, that caring nature will come out. Of course, getting the SP to like you and all of these things that I've already explained, if you're doing them right, the SP will like you. And the last part is act like a real doctor, not a robot. Now, I'm going to sort of repeat myself a lot saying you need to do these things over and over and over. You need to ask these mnemonics over and over and over. You need to do this physical exam over and over and over. You will feel like a robot. And if it comes to exam time and you feel like a robot because you can do everything so perfectly without thinking, that's what you want. But then you have to inject your own personality, your, your soft skills, your, um, your connection with the patient, all of these things that make it feel more personal. So you have to act like a person, but you have to have the skills and the repetitive nature of a robot in order to do well. And most importantly, just demonstrate that you can competently care for a patient. If the patient feels like, okay, this person who's sitting across from me, I know they're a second year medical student, third year medical student, but man, I would definitely trust them to be my doctor in a few years. That's what you want. You want to come across as someone who's in the right profession. And if you demonstrate all of these skills and demonstrate everything that I'm about to show you in the rest of these lectures, then you will come across as a competent patient who is able to care for a patient. Now, how do we foster the relationship? So this is one of the important components of the CIS. Now, according to usmily.org, this fostering of the relationship can be achieved by, number one, listening attentively. What does that mean? It means when they're talking, you don't. Right? So a lot of times when we're talking and having a conversation with someone, we tend to butt in and um, sort of just inject our own words here and there, but don't do that with, with this, this um, exam. Let the patient talk, and when they're done, then you can talk. Then you want to show interest in the patient as a person. Okay, um, Everybody is unique, and they have their individual lives, and you should seek out 
to find a little bit about each person that you come in contact with. And the third is to demonstrate caring, genuous, genuineness, concern, and respect. Okay, that goes without saying how we do that. But how do we actually do these things? Well, you want to have and demonstrate the right demeanor. These are things I'm going to show you how to do. You want to say things with a certain tone. For example, if someone is coming in because they're feeling really down because let's say their spouse passed away, you don't want to talk in a jovial tone. You want to sort of talk in a more sympathetic tone like this. You have to adjust your tone to fit the specifics of that encounter. And how do we demonstrate caring, genuineness, concern, and respect? Well, the easiest way is to actually genuinely care about the person sitting across from you. And that should be easy because if you're going into medicine, regardless of the main reason you might have gone into it, whether it's for the prestige or for the money, you do have to care about the patient. That's what's going to make you a good physician. If you're just going in and you're seeing patients to try and rack up um, billable hours, you're not going to come across as someone who's genuinely caring and that will affect your career. You genuinely need to care about the person. So pretend they're your family, your friend, whatever you have to do, but put yourself in that mind space, that head space where you say, I am going to go in and in the next 15 minutes, my, the only thing in my world is making sure that this patient feels heard, um, feels that I'm concerned about them, that I respect them. If you can do that, then you will properly foster the relationship. So here's a few real life examples of how we can foster the relationship. So how to listen attentively. Something to do is to make eye contact when you're not taking notes. So the patient's talking and you're listening, you're trying to gather information, make eye contact. Don't stare at the SP while blindly writing notes in your book or don't look at the SP at all while they're talking. Those are things you want to avoid. How do you show interest in the person, in the patient as a person? Do ask about their kids or their grandkids. Ask about their job. Ask about their hobbies. Don't ask anything personal. For example, hey, when's the last time you went out on a date? That just can be awkward, right? Stick to things that they'll be excited and jovial about talking, like their job, their hobbies, their kids, their grandkids. How to show concern. Saying things like, I'm so sorry to hear that, or that must be very hard with an empathetic tone is the perfect way to show concern. Now, how do you show respect? You want to address them with respect. So even if let's say you're a 40 year old and you're seeing a 19 year old girl, you would, you would call her Ms. Smith, not just let's say Samantha, right? You want to address them with respect. So they're a Mr., they're Sir, they're Mrs., they're ma'am. Then lend them a hand when they need to sit up or sit down, et cetera, no matter how old they are. These are just signs of respect. Now, if you walk in and you, you, you call the patient, let's say Mr. Jones or Mr. Smith, and he says, oh, please call me Brian, then okay, you can call him Brian. But you never want to just assume that. And some people can be very sensitive when they're older than you and you don't respect them and you just call them by their first name, right? You should respect everybody you walk into the room. And that's, this is just a very easy way to do that. Now, how do we combine our CIS into our info gathering skills, right? Now, the information gathering is most likely ICE, but the way you do it calls your CIS skills into play. So sometimes when CIS enters into the information gathering phase would be at the beginning. So for example, all right, Mr. Jones, I see you're here for a headache. Would it be okay with you if I asked you a few questions? In between question sequences. So for example, you should break down your HPI into their own section of questions, your review of systems, your past medical, your social. So let's say you finished asking HPI questions. You would say something like this. Mr. Jones, so thank you so much for answering all those questions. Now, if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask you a few questions, just general head-to-toe types of questions to get a better overall idea of your health. Would that be okay? So what you're doing here is you're thanking them for allowing you to ask questions about one section. Then you're going to ask them if it's okay if you ask a new set of questions. And so you're basically prefacing each new set of questions with your own question of permission. After interview questions, thank them. So, thanks, Mr. Jones, for answering all my questions. After the physical exam is complete, thank you, Mr. Jones, for allowing me to perform the physical exam. Right? This is just really simple, it's almost common sense things, but a lot of students forget to do these things and they can make a big difference in your overall score. So here's a few examples. At the beginning, is it okay if I ask you a few questions? In between questions, thank you for answering those questions. Would you mind if we switched gears and I asked you some questions about your family history? After the interview questions, 
Thank you for answering all of my questions. Would it be okay if we moved on to the physical exam now? After completing the physical exam, thank you for allowing me to complete the physical exam. Is it okay if I take a seat and discuss my initial impressions with you? So you should sort of start seeing what we're doing here is we're asking permission a lot and we're thanking them for everything they allow us to do. The more you ask permission and the more you thank them for allowing you to do things, the more cis points are going to come into play. And you're going to start to develop this, this aura about you where the SP is just saying, wow, this guy is really respectful. He asks me if I can do things, thanks me every time. That's You want to leave that room and you want the SP to think, no, that, that was a very um, respectful and you know pleasant person to be around. That's what you want. You want them to be in that mindset that you are impressive when they go to grade your note, to give you those um, check marks. Yes, 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 yes. Another important part of the SIS is showing an ability to help the SP make decisions. Now, you could do this by doing things like outlining what should happen next. We talked about this already on the last slide, but as you move through the, through the encounter, always let the patient know what you want to do next. Not only does this show that you're working with them, but also that you're not just doing whatever you want. Remember, you're not just being a dictator in that room. It's a team effort. You also want to link decisions to a rationale. So whether it's you or your patient making the decision, always give them your rationale and or make sure that you ask them for theirs for any decision they might make. So for example, if you need to run some tests and they say, I don't want any tests, ask them why. What's the rationale for them not wanting any tests? And Another way to show the ability to help the SP make decisions is to assess a patient's level of agreement, willingness, and ability to carry out the next steps. This means that you're going to use your best judgment as to whether or not patient's acceptance or denial about what's going on is coming from a place of competence and decision-making capacity. Now, how can we demonstrate information-providing skills? First, by using terminology that the patient can understand. This goes back to one of the first things we talked about with respect to speaking in layman's terms. So you want to avoid medical jargon, right? So you're going to say pulled muscle, um, pulled hamstring instead of, let's say, a lumbar strain or a hamstring strain, okay? Just as an example. Number two, provide reasons that the patient can accept. If you're going to do something, you want to let the patient know why. So Mr. Jones, I'm going to be listening to your heart and inspecting your chest because your chest pain makes me think that there might be something wrong with your cardiovascular system. You want to always give them a reason for what you're doing. You want to make clear and you want to make understandable statements. So how do we do this? Obviously, speak clearly. Don't mumble. Make sure the patient knows and understands what you said and is in agreement. And the way that you make sure that they heard you and they understand and they agree is by confirming. So Mr. Jones, I know I just told you a few things. Are you okay with all of that? They say yes, then you move on. Number four, match the amount of information provided by the patient's needs, preferences, and abilities. This means if the patient is really interested, then share more information. So let's say you're seeing a 19-year-old female, and she's a nursing student, and she's asking you all these questions, and she's really showing interest. Talk to her on that same level and give her more. If she wants to learn from you, then that's good. Give her as much information as she wants. Now, if the patient is, let's say, old and they have altered mental status, only share what you know that they can handle. Number five, ensure the patient demonstrates full and accurate understanding of key messages. So be sure that the SP hears and understands what you're asking or saying. Ask them if they understand and ensure that they actually do. The next component is how to demonstrate an ability to support emotions. So you want to see clarification or elaboration of a patient's feelings. If you're not 100% sure what they're feeling, ask them to help you better understand. There's nothing wrong with that. You also want to make them realize that when they're talking, you understand what they're saying. And you can do this by saying things like, I understand, I'm here for you. I'm so sorry to hear that, okay? These are really important keys to make sure that you're demonstrating the ability to support emotions. Now, a few behaviors or skills that you need to improve in order to improve your CIS score. The first one is bookending, and I mentioned this a few minutes ago. You have, if you have a bunch of books, you wanna put bookends to make sure they don't move. And those bookends are just solid, heavy um, pieces of furniture that keep things together. Now, bookending is sort of the same idea. You're just applying it to your case. So you wanna have a great entrance and a great exit. And the way you do that, we've already talked about what to do when you enter the room, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later. But you also wanna close properly. And you're gonna do that with the closure script that I'm gonna give you a little bit later. So when you walk in, the first impression's gotta be so good that the SP remembers you for the rest of the day. The closure needs to be so good 
that you stand out from everyone else. And I have a script for you that only we use. You won't find this information anywhere else. And it's a great script that will make you stand out and really just put a great ending to a hopefully great encounter, which means you leave, they're super happy with you, you get full marks. Another thing, and I've mentioned this before and I'm gonna keep harping on it, ask permission always. When you're gonna do the physical, when you're gonna ask questions, when you wanna do anything, ask permission every step of the way. And also don't forget to explain what you're doing. Explain the questions you're going to ask. I'm gonna ask you questions about the complaint that you have right now. I'm gonna ask you some questions about your family history. I'm going to ask you some questions about your social history, right? Just explain to them what you're going to ask. Explain the physical exams that you do and as you do them. So you start your physical exam. Mr. Jones, I'm going to listen to your heart. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, thank you for allowing me to listen to your heart. Um, next, I'm going to listen to your lungs. Do you mind? Not a problem. Always explain what you're doing, and then when you're done, thank them for allowing you to do it. Learning to demonstrate empathy. An extremely important soft skill. We'll talk about this a little bit more later um, when we actually dive deep into understanding empathy and sympathy and how to do how to show it but first of all let's talk about just the basics why we do it it shows the patient that you truly care about their well-being that's super important when do we do it a couple times we can demonstrate empathy to make sure we get our points at the onset of the encounter when they tell you why they came to see you so you sit down you say i, I understand you have a headache is that right yeah i've had a headache for about five hours it's really really hurting me this is a great time to demonstrate empathy Mr. Smith, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm gonna do my best to figure out what's going on and hopefully we'll get you feeling better as soon as possible. You got your empathy point right there. Another time is when they're sharing something troubling, right? So let's say you find out that their spouse died five years ago when you asked them if they're married. They're not upset anymore. It's been a long time, they've healed. Um, but they say, you say, are you sexually active? And the, let's say the female patient says, no. I'm, my husband died a few years ago and I haven't dated anyone else since. You say, oh, I'm so sorry, Mrs. Smith, to hear that. Are you doing okay? She'll, say, she'll probably say, yeah, I'm okay. Thank you for asking. You got your sympathy, your empathy point right there. That's all you need to do. So one thing you don't want to do is overdo it. I would say two to three demonstrations of empathy per encounter will be sufficient. Sometimes when we've had live students, they'll overdo it. And let's say the patient has a headache. And 10 times throughout the encounter, they bring up the headache or they show that they're in pain. The, the, the uh, student might stop every single time and say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. After a while, it just becomes obvious that you're trying too hard. And that doesn't come across as genuine. It comes across as robotic. And that's what you want to avoid. Now, there's some situation-specific actions you always need to be aware of. And that is if the patient's coughing or if they have a headache and they're sensitive to light or let's say their stomach's killing them or they have back pain, always, if they cough, offer a tissue and water. If they have a headache, offer to dim the lights. If they have back pain or abdominal pain, ask them if they'd be more comfortable in a different position or laying down. It's paying attention and being aware of what's going on and then offering to help them. These are just small behaviors you can do that will go a long way in getting you all of your cyst points. You also need to learn how to perform painless maneuvers. You should never cause pain to the patient. Always avoid painful areas. Never repeat a painful maneuver. And let's say you're in the abdomen and there's right lower quadrant pain. You obviously have to palpate the area, work on the area, but you wanna start at the point furthest away from the pain and then slowly move closer towards it. And when you get close, make sure you're paying close attention to not hurt the patient. And if you cause any pain, Ask them if you can continue, and if they say no, then just move, um, move on. Don't continue trying to palpate for cussing an area that's in pain. All right, we just covered a ton of information. I suggest you go through this one more time. Make sure you caught everything. Take exam number two, go through the exam, see where you made mistakes, and then review those areas to make sure you don't make them again. Start practicing your mnemonics by writing them out. You practiced yesterday or earlier by learning the mnemonics. Now I want you to start writing them out. Choose three to four of the mnemonics and write them out five to 10 times each, and then just continue to do that every single day until you've mastered all of them. And as I promised, here's the sample SP checklist. Now this is not comprehensive. This is just to give you an idea. Um, they'll come to a computer and there'll be questions. And it'll say, did the student ask the following? Where's the pain's location? What's the pain's intensity? And they're gonna check, yes, 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 no, no, no. Now you're gonna notice a lot of these are the mnemonics. Did they ask this? Did they ask this? Did they ask this? Did they ask this? 
That's why we recommend and, and really, really push hard that you use the mnemonics because when you're in that situation, it's easy to forget some of the smaller details. The mnemonics will make sure you don't and they'll get you a lot of your points. That's why we tell people, if you know your mnemonics and you ask every single question that you should for, for each case, um, using the proper mnemonics, of course, you're gonna get 95% of the questions that you need. And then you might need to ask one or two different ones if they, if they say something that you weren't expecting. But this is just an idea of sort of what the SP's checklist would look like. So you have an idea um, moving forward. Now, when you review your cases from your SP um, encounter book, there's laundry lists of, of checklists, and that's going to be more um, telling of what the actual CS's uh, SP checklist might look like. Okay, obviously it's not the real one. We've created our own based on our own um, encounters, but you'll get a very good idea of what they might be doing after the encounter, so you know at least what you need to do to be successful.